Irene, welcome to the podcast. Chris, thank you. <laughs> it's good to be here. Um, thank you for taking the time to come here, uh, to come onto the podcast. You're, you're in the UK at the moment because I um, am. you're over here for a workshop that you're holding. Uh, you normally reside in, in Canada. So yes. thanks for taking the time to do that. Of course, it's good to talk. Always good to talk about yeah. these things. Great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, before I get into asking you yeah, who you are and a little bit of your story, I thought it would maybe it could be a good idea to read part of an email that I sent to your team mm-hmm. that would uh, help to explain to people that are listening why we have you on the podcast or why I asked for you to come onto the podcast. The reason I came to Irene's work was as one of those students that has tried, experimented with multiple different techniques from Chinese medicine to Reiki to Vipassana to Vision Quest to plant medicines and ancestral healings and a whole lot more over a 15 year period. Irene's work was the first modality that kept me in my body and allowed me to grow an awareness of what I was trying to deal with. With everything else, I was being catapulted out of my body and unable to, to make any sense of what was going on. Via Irene's work, I was able to establish a framework of what I was experiencing and why I was experiencing it. Mm-hmm. So to, to, to give that context, James, uh, you know, my, my partner in mm-hmm. We Move, who's, who's not here today, obviously, uh, him and I have been on quite the journey and, mm-hmm. and individually I've been on the journey for about 15 years. As I, as I alluded to there, trying many, many different yeah. healing modalities, yeah. I guess we'll, we'll call them. <clears throat> And it was only when I came across your work that <laughs> I felt like I've put 15 years work into getting to your work. And it was only when I came to your work that I actually felt like, oh, oh, this is what I've been looking for for 15 years. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know that this is what I was looking for. Mm-hmm. And I was totally distracted by all the glitters. I know. And, uh, you know, and I suffered a lot of consequences because of that. Yeah. And um, so, so that's why I was, you know, I started doing your work at, uh, about two years ago, working my way through all the free resources on mm-hmm. your website. And then working my way through your uh, your course, the twenty one day nervous system tune up, mm-hmm. and then you have a third course, smart body, smart mind. Yes, um, which no doubt I'll get to at some point. And um, so it was only when I came across your work that I started to be able to really understand understand my my lived experience. Yeah, understand my past, <clears throat> understand why I was acting the way that I had acted, whether that was with good intent or or, or not bad intent, but naive intent, and. Um, and I was just that alone. If if that's all I would have taken from your work, that alone would have been, mm. you know, worth its weight in gold to me. So so this is why I, you know I asked, to, uh, you know, I reached out to your team and asked if we could. Yeah, I'm glad could, you did. We could connect. So so maybe we could just take a step back and yes. I ask who you are. Yes. <laughs> yes. And um, you know. Yeah. How you came to this work? Yeah. Well, the, I'll start by saying what you just said. You know, you took 15 years to get here. I hear that all the time. And not just from folks who are young, like yourself, but folks who are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 50s. And so if I use that beginning, I got into this work because the things I had studied in university for bachelor's work in science, master's degree in science. Um, I was a fitness trainer and, and applied human nutrition in my 20s and all that. And I even did very sophisticated mind body work in my late twenties, which was amazing. And, you know, we can go into the history of that, but even that wasn't the final piece. And I don't think those there's ever a final, final piece, but I got into, um, what I do now because I saw a lack in the methods that I was using in my private practice. So I'll kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll speak about my history more recent and then I'll go back if sure. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm trained as something called a Feldenkrais practitioner. Most people have no idea what that is. Um, but as a quick, quick and dirty, it is a very sophisticated form of body, mind, neuroplastic work that reteaches the system how to move again, how to move with the skeletal system, um, how to find less effort in movement, very much like babies. I talk about, I'm probably gonna mention babies a lot in our talk <laughs> because it's, it's they're really the purest um, visual of how we're supposed to be. And then of course, mm. conditioning and culture just screws it up for in, in many ways, especially in the West, right? The East, mm, some, in some instances it's different, but not so much from what I'm seeing these days. So, I studied the Feldenkrais work because um, my own body wasn't healing from a whole bunch 
of injuries from skiing and sport, so downhill skiing. So I got into the Feldenkrais work. It, it literally saved me. Um, started practicing, loved it, had great success with a lot of people the way I had success with it. But then there was this sort of summer, it was the summer of 2008, and I had all these clients that um, weren't getting better with the Feldenkrais work the way it got me better and many of my other clients. And I thought, this is strange. What am I missing? And being inquisitive and always being okay not knowing, like I'm, I'm very, I don't want to ever be a hypocrite, mm -hmm. right? It's like, okay, I don't know what to do here. Let's figure it out. So I don't actually know how it happened, but, but the work of Peter Levine landed in front of me. And I think, I don't know if I read one of his books. I'm not sure what I did. Google was just kind of starting then, but something was like, this is it. This is what I need to do next. So I, I signed up for a somatic experiencing training in 08, did that over two years. And for me, that was like what opened up my system to realize, oh my goodness, I'm missing an entire piece. What one could say I'm not missing. It's more like this is the next piece. Mm -hmm. um, so did that, went full steam ahead. Not that I stopped practicing Feldenkrais, but it, it just kind of went into the background and did as many levels as I could with, with the training, with Peter, master classes, and then got into working um, at a deeper level. You wouldn't have been exposed to this yet in the 21 days, but working with early trauma, working with the somatic system at a very pre-verbal right. way, meaning um, that type of trauma that occurs developmentally in utero um, when we aren't making connection with meaning in the world. Yeah. That was revolutionary because I could see, I now could see, oh, this is why in my Feldenkrais training in 04 to 07, there were people in that class, no matter how much they put in, no matter how much they tried, they just couldn't get into their bodies or they would be overtaken with terror doing something so simple. And it, it, it just kind of, everything just fell, it's like a Tetris, you know, everything just fell into place. And so that was to me the piece that was really missing that I had to uncover. And so studied with Kathy Kane, another kind of prominent figure in this work, Stephen Terrell, another prominent figure. And all these people are trained also in somatic experiencing. So in many ways, somatic, somatic experiencing, you know, credit to Peter, he was sort of the godfather right. of getting this stuff on the map at this deeper somatic level that, that says to us, we're animals, but we're also mammals and we're also humans. And that is a very confusing mix of things in a complex world where there is not just one way to be. Yeah. And by that, I mean, if you think about, um, I mean, I'll use the example here. There's a lot of sheep around us right now. <laughs> <laughs> we are in North Yorkshire. <laughs> yes. And, um, there's some sheep in Canada, not as much, but there's sheep there, right? Yeah. I usually use a bear example, but I don't think you have any bears here. No, we here. don't. No, thank God. <laughs> um, so we have raccoons, you have badgers. There's raccoons are hilarious though. <laughs> yeah. So these are mammals, right? And when you have a, a sheep um, here or in Canada, when they have their babies, they're going to do the same thing here in England mm -hmm. as in Canada, as in New Zealand, Australia. Austria, there's no questioning and they're not getting out a manual to figure out how to raise their young. You know, they keep them safe, they lick them, they feed them. And the difference though, is these animals are very more simplistic in their brain. Yeah. Right. And so then you take us humans and we're just so complex, so diverse in how we are brought up. And so it's not simple enough to just say, oh yeah, to heal, you have to do this one thing. Peter really put out on the map the reason why humans, and this is a real oversimpl oversimplification now that we know what we know, but I'll say what he said in the 70s, 60s, 
Humans um, are the one animal that basically um, they can keep their, their expression inside. They trap their trauma because they don't release the energy. If you were to say to a mother bear, or if a mother bear was to see a predator coming to her cub, she's not going to think, should I, should I attack this wolf? She just does it. Like, there's no question. Whereas a human animal, I can tell you I've worked with a lot of humans, a lot of adults whom were in abusive home environments, and the mother or the father didn't protect them from the predator, whether it was the other parent or a sibling or a babysitter, and they knew bad stuff was happening to their kids, yeah. or they were doing the bad stuff, but they didn't stop it. Why is that? In the animal kingdom, that would never occur. So that's a huge biological philosophical question, but that is kind of why it's so complex to heal the human condition. It's not just one thing that we need to work with. Like if all the sheep get sick, it's like, oh, well, there must be a contaminant in the water. Yeah. Right. Or, or they got some bacteria and they're all sick because of that. So Peter really put on the map, humans do not release their traumatic stress responses I'm really oversimplifying, yeah. and I know you know this. Yeah, but that's okay. <laughs> like, yeah, people need to be able to understand. Right. It, you know? So they don't release these things, and so they have stored in them what we would call fight, flight, and it stores because of the freeze response. And what happens? It's like if you cage a tiger, and this was Peter's first book, Waking the Tiger. If you cage a tiger, they get sick. We know this from what happens in zoos and when when tigers are kept in someone's home yeah. in Las Vegas, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. for example. And so they get sick, they get overly aggressive, you know, they get autoimmune conditions, they lose their hair, they don't have a desire to hunt. This isn't normal yeah. for a tiger. So humans, we're storing all this stuff, whether it's not speaking up, not hitting back when someone's, you know, attacking us, um, not allowing our impulses to come out, you know, um, well, I'm in Britain, so I'll say it, that classic <laughs> stiff British upper lip. Yeah. You know, th the thin lip isn't uh, a defect. It's there because there's a pursing and keeping in of the emotion and it makes the structure change. Wow. And so you, you bring that into the body and toxicity starts to build. And we know now through um, research, specifically the ACE study, Adverse Childhood Experiences study, that when we have had early adversity where we store in this, we'll, let's just call it survival stress, trauma, it creates later in life, if we don't work with it at the deep level that you're learning about now through my work, and of course Peter's work and my predecessors, we will get sick. There will be a chronic illness, a cancer, a mental illness, an addiction, um, a debilitation, a neurodegenerative condition, ALS, MS, these things that are just like skyrocketing right now. Um, the nervous system is at risk. It isn't in good flow. It's storing that survival stress through a massive um, freeze response that's basically stopping the system from being in flow. So to go back to, you know, how I got into this work, that's kind of the tail end, which might be the most important part is I was highly sophisticated already in working with the human body through my training in biomed science, exercise science, rehab science. And I got into Feldenkrais because all of that wasn't helping my injuries improve. And then I got into the Feldenkrais work. It helped myself immensely. That's what I'm teaching here this weekend. Um, but then for the people that had excess survival stress, even the mind-body work wasn't enough because their system was that trap tiger, right? essentially. So um, I would say that sitting here right now is an interesting moment because as we spoke about before we started recording, you know, there's so much out there for healing and all of it, I think, has a time and a place. I don't think anything is accidental. And I have found, as you have, that there are some basic foundations and things that we have to learn first 
before we go to the more advanced practices. Mm -hmm. And um, just like you can't take a newborn baby and ask them to do a math problem right away. You yeah. can't ask them to sit up and hold you know, a fork and feed themselves. They are immature and they have to develop. And so for many of us, although we're you know, living, breathing and functional, functional in our lives, many of us didn't get that early nervous system health that um, really we need for just being vital and robust. So I'll pause and then you, you great. Let me I mean, know. that I mean, that kind of naturally leads us on to um, going to the foundations, right? Yeah. And, and explaining, you know, what is the nervous system? What is your autonomic nervous system? You mentioned mm -hmm. the fight and flight and simp uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. And I feel actually, on a side note, like I've, I've heard those terms banded around so much in the past several years. Yes. <laughs> and I was one of them. <laughs> by people that didn't really understand what they meant yeah. and didn't know the subsections of them. Yeah. And, you know, so if you don't mind, yeah. it'd be wonderful to, you know, and again, of course, we can't, can, there's only so much we can, we can or so much depth yeah. we can go into here, no. but, to, but to have a, a, an overview of that mm -hmm. w would be great because then mm -hmm. that can lead us into talking about regulation and dysregulation mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Yeah, it's pretty, I mean, it's simple and it's complex, but I'll kind of draw a map with my hand as I talk. Um, you know, the human has a nervous system, but we have many nervous systems. So, you know, as, as I sit here and I put my hand to my, my skull, you know, there's the brain and then the brain comes out a spinal cord. That's the central nervous system in the center. And then there's the peripheral nervous system, just like peripheral vision, it lets you see out to the side. The peripheral nervous system is all the nerves that come out of the brain and out of the spinal cord. Most people have heard of the vagus nerve. That is a cranial nerve that comes out of the brain and then it snakes all through the body. There's another level. So the peripheral nervous system then has two more branches, the sympathetic nervous system, or I should say there's the autonomic nervous system, Yeah. right? Autonomic nervous system. And what I like to call the somatosensory motor nervous system. So I'm holding this microphone, got some tea here. You know, I can hold it, move it, feel the temperature, and then slowly put it down and not crash it on this thing. Yeah. That's happening through this somatic sensory motor thing, this yeah. nervous system. So we need that. The, the autonomic nervous system is exactly as it says, it's automatic, it's automatic, it's autonomic. So if, you know, I had this in my hand and I felt like it was gonna fall because I misplaced it, I would probably have a reflex to try to, to catch it or something like that. That autonomic nervous system we need for survival. We need, you know, you drop the knife when you're cutting vegetables at your kitchen counter and what does your foot do? It, it, naturally reflexes back to avoid getting hurt. Um, so this autonomic nervous system is responsible for the fight flight and fight flight isn't just dangerous, you know, mm -hmm. abusive car accidents. It's like the knife thing that I just mentioned, you know, you're, you know, you're not going to die, you know, yeah. but it's still a threat. Fight flight, flight would be run. Like, let's say the fire alarm went off while we were in here. Yeah. Please don't happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> We would probably stop the interview and do our version of fleeing yeah. to make sure everything's okay to preserve our safety. You know, flight in a more significant uh, stance would be the classic um, impala in the savanna is being chased by a cheetah and it's fleeing, it's trying to get away. Let's just say um, that impala can't get away and there's a great video on the internet about this mm, and you would I've have seen it it's amazing and you would have seen it's incredible, it yeah. on my videos uh the cheetah is chasing these impalas and it gets this impala and the impala is literally like you know stiff as a board and the cheetah leaves and you think the impala is dead but it's not because it's like and it 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 shakes up and it you know it prounces away that's a sign of that animal going into freeze waiting for the kill it's waiting to die it's not thinking it it's completely automatic and so we humans have that because we're also animals we're also mammals 
So that's, again, just to remind everyone, that's the autonomic nervous system. And I just described the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic is the fight flight. And also to add, the sympathetic is also like if we decided to go for a walk outside, we would engage our sympathetic to get our heart rate up, blood to the muscles. So it's not, again, a, a negative thing. It's just yeah. what we need. The parasympathetic is a bit more tricky. The parasympathetic is the freeze. It allows us to shut down. It allows us to numb out. But to make it even more confusing, it's also the rest digest. And it's also what allows me to see you and see that you're nodding and know that I'm making sense, I think, right? It's the social engagement part. And the parasympathetic, when everybody talks about the vagus nerve, that's it, right? So the vagus nerve forms these portions of the parasympathetic. Now, um, to make it even more complex, <laughs> <laughs> um, that rest digest of the parasympathetic, it goes to the, the, the vagus nerve, the parasympathetic goes to the gut, all the organs. I won't name them all, but every single organ we have. So when we're resting, when we're hopefully, when we sleep, when we're chilling out, this part of the parasympath parasympathetic, the rest digest goes into active mode. It repairs, it, it regenerates cells, it keeps the gut lining nicely stitched up. Um, it enhances our immune function, all these things. We need that. We need rest, digest. We need parasympathetic. The interesting thing is that rest, digest branch is also what governs the freeze. Right. This is where we get co more complex with the jargon. And I'll say it just for, for people to know is the rest, digest is called the low tone yeah. dorsal of the parasympathetic or the low tone dorsal of the vagus nerve. Whereas the freeze, the shutdown, is the high, high tone dorsal of the parasympathetic of the vagus. I liken it to um, a manual transmission on a car. In North America, no one drives stick, but here everybody does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? it's true. It's kind of interesting that. Um, <laughs> But it's like that, like, like the, the parasympathetic, this branch of the parasympathetic, this dorsal tone is like the engine and then you choose the gear, right? So the low gear would be where there's this resting, this digesting, and then the high tone would be this fast, but it can get sometimes confusing because people are like, what do you mean it's fast, but it's freeze? Well, if you've ever had a situation where you have to freeze like that impala you don't gently go into it you kind of are there yeah right now that's an extreme of shock um but there's another situation in our world which is i call it functional freeze this was coined i think by my by my teacher kathy kane and functional freeze is the ability to function highly in society this was me by the way Right. Up until just a few years ago, you're in functional freeze. You can think your digestion is working, but the system is overriding the basic kind of needs underneath. I think if I hadn't gone out of functional freeze, eventually things would have started to go sideways. Right. But many people that, let's say, are high achievers, but they have like that insomnia or have, they have a little bit of the gut problem or they have a little bit of an autoimmune problem, but it's just not bad enough and they can keep pushing. That is, for the most part, someone living in functional freeze. Mm -hmm. But under that freeze is that sympathetic, is that fight flight. Yeah. And so to go back, Again, we've got the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, peripheral nervous system comes out of those. And then you have the autonomic nervous system, which is the fight, flight, freeze, but also the rest, digest, and also the social engagement. And this is, I think, where in the influencer space, people kind of go, not sideways, but they get a little wrong. They just say rest, digest is parasympathetic or is vagus. Yeah, definitely. My I've said that. Yeah. <laughs> and I've heard many other people say that. And it's 
partially true, but it's not the whole truth. Sure. The, the, the vagus nerve also puts us into freeze. Yeah. Right? But it depends on the different tone of the low tone dorsal. Yeah. It's a basic incorrect understanding of, yeah. the, pers- of yeah. the penis. And it's okay. You know, the thing is, is that this, this understanding was discovered by Dr. Stephen Porges, the researcher. And I mean, when I got into my somatic experiencing training, that understanding had just kind of surfaced out. And unless you read the fine print of his very thick, hard to read book, <laughs> you're not going to get that distinction. Yeah. You know, I didn't even learn about these different tones in my somatic experiencing training. It was through Kathy Kane who did the work to go like line by line to figure it out. So I understand why the influencers on Instagram yeah. who are teaching some breathing exercises and vagal toning exercises, which in my opinion don't really exist because you can do a toning exercise, but if you're in functional freeze, it's not going to do anything. Yeah. And so to go back, because I haven't finished the nervous system story mm-hmm. yet, I mentioned peripheral, there's the autonomic, but then the autonomic also governs the digestion. It governs the temperature regulation, the, the, the muscle contractions, the perfusion, the, the dilation of the pupils of the eyes, um, all, all the hormone release. And so when we're healthy, when we have good flow of sympathetic and parasympathetic, and we're not constantly in a state of fight, flight, or freeze, The digestive organs, the heart, the lymph, all these things, they tick over nice and smoothly. A person rests, they repair, they are active to get the blood going, they gain muscle, all the things. It's really, really healthy and good. But what we know, especially in Western world with all the chronic conditions, not just physical, but mental, emotional, relational, the system is living in too much survival stress, too much high fight, flight, and shutdown freeze. And so what happens is when we're in that state, the system is just in damage control. It's like right. It's like the house is on fire. So we got to keep putting out the fire. We're not going to worry about dusting, you know, the coffee tables because that's not important. And so what happens is when somebody is in this survival stress over and over, their gut just doesn't get taken care of. Their immune system just doesn't really get taken care of. The the hormones don't do what they're supposed to. The temperature doesn't know how to regulate um, all these things. Yeah. So that's how we now see um, the consequence of stored survival stress. And this lines up with the ACE study. So the theory and that we could say the epidemiological research, which is the ACE study, um, and just people's experience, um, the, the rise in chronic illness, it's all lining up, right, with this, this excess stress, not enough time to recover. And then the reason I'm here is not enough tools, you know, to talk to you yeah. that are accurate to get people out of fight, flight, and freeze and into regulation. Right. So then just to yes. take a brief step back yeah. to, tr- to try and summarize it in a very basic way, and so we have the autonomic nervous system and we have two branches. We have this, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Then the parasympathetic nervous system, system itself has two branches, which is ventral vagal and dorsal vagal. And then the dorsal vagal has two branches, which is low tone and high tone. Correction. It has two tones. Two, it has, correction, it has two tones. So the, do- the, the tones aren't branches, it's the gearbox sorry, again. Sorry, yeah. so, sorry, two no, tones. But no, you're, you're good. And so what I should tell people to do, and we can link to it, is yeah. for people to actually go online and see a visual representation of that, because it's one thing describing I it. I know. But, <clears throat> and so then <clears throat> the ideal state, if, I, if I'm correct, mm-hmm. would be that we would have the ability to, to move between uh, the sympathetic nervous system, mm-hmm. so when we need to engage that energy to play, yeah. to go yeah. for a run or something like that, uh, to ventral uh, vagal, social engagement, creativity, um, y- digestion, and then and then also the the low tone dorsal, which is where we we're actually going to be able to go to sleep in the evenings. Yes. So being able to move through those three yes. different categories. Yes. The one thing I'll correct you, it's it's not wrong, but ventral isn't the rest digest. How, right. However, when we're in more ventral, and I didn't mention this, so that the part of the 
the ventral branch of the vagus, it goes to the throat, the eyes, parts of the ear, um, and to the heart, to the pacemaker of the heart. It's called the SA node. And when we are in good ventral connection, social engagement, that is supportive and caring, it can bring the system down. It can, and this is why, you know, um, good bedside manner from a nurse or a doctor or a mm. therapist is really important. Wow, yeah. Because it, 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 it's like, oh, they're, they're listening to me. They're attuning with me. They're, they see where I am. It's, I'm at ease now. And so that actually goes directly to the heart to lower down. But when that happens, it also, you know, we're never just only ventral or only. Yeah. And so then it allows a little bit of that rest digest to come in. So while right now we're sitting um, and a little bit of sympathetic is here, I just had lunch. Um, when we started, I felt a bit warm because I was regulating to this room that's a bit stuffy, you know, and I'm not hot anymore because my system, my autonomic nervous system is fairly regulated. It's figured out how to cool down. I'm clearly digesting, but we're having a good conversation. And so I'm in a bit of ventral. I'm a little bit of rest digest, mm. a little bit of sympathetic, and I can pretty much guarantee I'm not in any freeze or, or fight flight. Right. Right. Um, and we're getting along. Yeah. Right. And you get this. If there was a little difference to that, I might be a little more on edge and a little uneasy. So the, the cool, the interesting thing with this autonomic nervous system is for when it's really well oiled and well regulated, you can feel these little rises maybe in sympathetic, but then it comes down. Right. You know, it, there isn't this jarringness of it. It's again, I go back to the, the car. It's like smooth transition yeah. rather than constantly grinding the clutch and, and popping and all that. It's just nice and smooth, even if things go really fast or go really low. And in your and, and in the uh, the course online, the way that that's displayed is it's almost like a bell curve yeah. where you can go up and down, up and down, yep. up and down very smoothly. You got it. Yeah. So what then influences our ability, um, or, or am I correct in saying what, mm -hmm. it, what influences the state that we're in is our ability to regulate or how dysregulated we are. Yes. And so what, is, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, what, and what, you know, what, what are the causes of, of both, I suppose? Sure, well, hmm. So what I'll do is I'll go back to infancy because mm. that's probably the best way to, to sure. describe it. So when, you know, to remember, remind everybody of the sheep, you know, little babies coming out. Um, when humans come out, we are not fully regulated. If we're full term, our digestion works like babies can poo and pee pee and, you know, they eat. Um, but they're not fully good at temperature regulation. They're not, their immunity isn't quite there yet. And they certainly can't talk and walk and they need to cry to let us know the, the, I call us the big people, cause it doesn't have to be a mother or father, the big people to know, Hey, I need help. And so when that baby cries, it sends a signal to the big person. I need something. Now the trick is that the big person has to interpret and attune. That's the key word attune to that infant to know what it needs. Good regulation and good attunement, and we would also say secure attachment, is that that caregiver listening to the baby going, hmm, that sounds like hunger, or that sounds like gas, or that's, or oh, look, baby is so hot and red in the face, they're too warm, let's loosen some clothing, or they look a little blue, maybe they're cold. Um, or they just look scared, like their eyes look freaked out. I better come and so that attunement lets the little one know someone's here. I see you. Maybe it requires a picking up. Maybe it just this, you know requires a little touch. Maybe it requires food or a blanket or whatever. And then the baby feels that connection, that attunement, and then their heart rate goes down because the ventral. Like you can't attune to a baby if you don't look at the baby. Right. I mean, you can hear it. I should say. I shouldn't say that. Um, women who are blind have babies, so they can hear. But you need to have that connection to the senses. 
And so by attuning, by offering what they need, their nervous system goes, ah, that feels good. That feels better. Or maybe it doesn't. And then the mother's like, okay, what else do I need to do? Oh, it's this, right? And so then that connection, that attunement goes to the, the baby's heart, what I just mentioned, that, that, that down regulation, and then they're fine. And that has to happen over and over and over again for many years. The first sort of three, some people say five, but really it's the first three years, that ventral vagal is being built up. So it's not built properly when right. we're born. Um, so that's being built up. It's getting, um, we would call it myelinated. So that nerve, that, that part of the vagus nerve has what's called myelination around it, which is this fatty sheath that makes the transmission of the nerve impulse much smoother. Um, versus, and I didn't mention this, it's a bit more extra, but the, the dorsal branch, the, the branch that de rest, digest, or freeze, it's not myelinated. It's much more automatic, right? And so it's a bit more clunky, but it works fast. Whereas that ventral, the myelination, it's more refined. It's more steady. That's why, as I felt myself, say, getting warm in here, it wasn't like, okay, I need to shift quickly. The system slowly was able to kind of, ah, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm sensing, I'm engaging. That engagement actually helped my system come down, slow down. So dysregulation, so that would be regulation. So baby gets good attachment, good security. They know they're safe. They're being engaged with, they're getting to move. They're getting to play. That creates good self-regulation through what we call co-regulation. Where it often goes sideways, which creates dysregulation, and I mean, we could spend 10 hours, so I'm not gonna go through all the things. <laughs> But something is misattuned. It could be that mom is in her own dysregulation, which is often the case. And then how that plays out could be anybody's guess. It could be she gets annoyed when baby cries. I'm not, I'm not dealing with that. I'm going to let them cry themselves, cry, cry and cry and cry. And we know for a, pretty much for a fact that letting a baby cry themselves to sleep or just not be attended to creates a freeze response. Right. And eventually that baby starts to learn, nobody's here, so I'm going to stop connecting. I'm going to stop engaging with the world because nobody's giving me that co-regulation to soothe me, so I'm just going to go into shutdown. I would say that, and I, this is not scientifically proven, but I would say most of Western society at this current day um, my generation, your generation, my parents' generation, unless they had really with it attuned parents, many of us were left to cry ourselves to sleep or not be attuned to. And it isn't just because of neglect. It's like parents are busy. Mm. They're in daycare. There's not enough people to go around and hold that baby. And we know through, um, I can't quote the research, but post-World War II, there were a lot of orphans, especially in Eastern Europe, and these orphanages had food and shelter and warmth. And there were people there making sure that the babies had clean, you know, I don't know if they had diapers, but they weren't in their feces, you know, like yeah. a caged dog would be. But they died. And it's because they didn't have that connection because their systems were freaking out. And the shutdown response was so high that the system just, just crashes. Wow. Right? So, so when we don't get that attunement, that connection, that safety, there's not enough layering of this co-regulation. And if the baby survives, which many can, like we are very robust creatures as humans, we can survive a lot of hardship. Um, eventually that laying down of the regulation isn't that great. And it gets wired such that we have really sophisticated coping strategies that are physiological. It's not brain-based. That little baby isn't thinking, oh, <laughs> I better figure out how to shut down because mom's not there. It's the biology saying, nobody's there, I better shut down. 
Um, have you heard, did you ever watch my video on Ted, Kaz Ted Kaczynski? Mm, I'm, I'm not sure actually. Okay. What was the, if, it was, might, it was called the story of Teddy and um, it's more of an American case, but um, he just recently passed. So he was technically called the Unabomber, not the nicest story. Right. Okay. But he, um, I know his story of birth because Peter Levine actually interviewed his mom. Right. And it's in one of Peter's books. And what happened when he was a baby is he developed a rash all over his body. And, I, and I'm not accurate with the numbers, but I think he was about six months old. He was an infant. And so she took him to the hospital. You got to understand this was probably the 50s, maybe the 40s. I think it was the 40s they took him in they strapped him to a table think about this a six month old yeah yeah it's terrible to think yeah, yeah, yeah. i've thought about it a lot so it doesn't bother me anymore yeah, yeah. it's just fascinating and they probably gave him some corticosteroids to bring the rash down which is what you would do and that's fine but they kept him there for i think it was two fucking weeks pardon my french strapped to the table for two weeks don't quote me on that. I have sure. it in my video. I have the accurate numbers. Yep. It was more than a day. Yep. And so, sorry, that big sigh. Yeah. So she comes to get him when the rash is over. You know, Western medicine suppressed that rash. It's possible he had a vaccination. He was allergic to something. And this came out. She picked him up and she said to Peter in the interview, my baby Teddy was never the same after that. When he went into the hospital, despite the rash, he was an exuberant, joyful little kid, little infant. He came out and he was dead. Not dead. Yeah, yeah. But he was he was in shutdown. He was in total freeze. Right. Functional freeze. Because if it was total freeze, he would have died like those orphaned yeah. orphans, right? What then occurred, and sadly, you can't find the Netflix series. There's a wonderful series um, on it called Manhunt where they found him through a certain type of forensic something where they they studied the writing right like how he spoke where he would have been schooled they did find him and and as they interviewed people around him and they created this uh, biopic series it turned out he was the kid in school who was doing bad things in science class he was making bombs he was trying to get his aggression out. Right. And then to make it even worse, he was picked up by, I think it was Harvard. He was super smart. So this was the other thing, just because you're in functional freeze and shock because of an early, so that was an early developmental trauma. It doesn't mean your brain can't be brilliant because he saw the world and what was wrong with it. His manifesto was actually quite poignant, right? He saw the problems with society because he was treated badly by society as a baby. He was then experimented on by the CIA with mind control. <laughs> right. Sorry, I'm this just is... going. I'm going right into it. No, no, absolutely fine. But like, <laughs> I'm just like, oh my god, you know. This is this was MK Ultra. I think yeah. it was what it was called. And what happened is they they picked him out. They saw he was a recluse. They saw something was not quite right with him. And so the professor, I'm saying this because you can't find the, the, the biopic anymore. Um, they befriended him and they had, he, he had him play chess with him every day after school or after university. Yeah. Befriended him, befriended him. And then one day he, he showed up and there was a chair in the office. And they're like, Theodore, this is a chair. We wanna, do you want to try an experiment? And so he said yes, because he wanted friends, because he yeah. had none, because he was socially inept yeah. due to the shock. Yeah. No ventral. Yeah. Think about it. He was six months old, so he never got the development of the ventral. Right. No empathy. Right. Gets into the chair. I'm getting shivers thinking about it right now. And they, they did some kind of electric shock. And I can't remember exactly what happened. You could probably find it online. But he was allowed to say stop at any time and he never did because he knew how to shut down right and so what occurred is he then realized they're using me and that's when he went crazy and started being violent and sending bombs in envelopes and he killed lots of people the odd part about this story is that 
he went to prison and he ended up in solitary confinement <sighs> alone in a room just like when he was a baby alone oh. in a room gosh this is what a terrible life it's a live. terrible life and it started because of his early trauma and of course it's a biopic but in the biopic they depict his brother his brother's wife the family and i can you, i'm pretty sure that was accurate the rest of the family were good people and so it's not that they were treating him poorly he had a terrible medical experience i actually think a lot of the psychopathy and troubles and and i know this from working with people a lot of their chronic illness autoimmune mental illness is due to horrific medical experiences and it could be a routine thing it doesn't have to be something like his thing it could be being held down because you're getting stitches or you know you just don't like the doctor you get a bad sense and no you have to stay here you have to have this happen so that that story um i call it the t the story of teddy it's on my youtube channel i have the accurate details right it's one of the best stories while tragic to describe how early trauma lack of lack of um growing the ventral even though mom was probably attuning to him cuz why would a why would a mother want to talk to peter levine and explain this like she yeah. she literally was probably it was she couldn't do anything about it um but it's a great story to show how you can trace these violent acts back to these things and we will re we will kind of perpetuate it's like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy that he ended up in in solitary in solitary so that's one story to kind of showcase i think why not to say that what he did was right because it clearly wasn't but to empathize with why that might be happening yeah because if you have good ventral vagal, good social, you are not going to harm anyone for good reason. Yeah. And a lot of people right now currently in the world are like, why do bad things happen? It's like, well, there could be lots of reasons, but one of the key reasons is lack of good self-regulation, attunement, and secure, safe attachment as infants and children. Right. And I'm not the only one that says that. My predecessors say it. We know that. Well, I mean, <laughs> just kind of, you don't need to even understand the theory to see, no. um, to see it make sense. Yeah. And then obviously to extrapolate from that, you know, what's going on in the, in the world, in all the different parts of the world with, uh, you know, various war zones and, uh, and what that is going to unleash <laughs> in the future. <laughs> yes. Because all those children are experiencing, you know, freeze. something that, yeah. They're exactly. all in freeze. They're in shock. Yeah. Yeah. And you see it, you know, in, in the videos that, that you see, you yeah. can, you can see that the, those children are in that state yeah yeah um so re so regulation versus di dysregulation yes. so, and then what causes dysregulation so early trauma mm -hmm. is, is one thing as mm -hmm. described there and then i've got two other list two others listed here shock trauma mm -hmm. and, and chromatic uh, chromatic chronic chronic traumatic stress. <laughs> stress yeah 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 those are kind of like i kind of have those just to categorize so we have early developmental trauma, um, shock trauma, which would be accidents, abuses. Um, the, the interesting thing is that the shock and the early developmental, they kind of bleed into each other depending on when things happened. Because you could have a child who is five years old who has a car accident, you know, they're in a car accident with their parents, but they're still developing. Yeah. But it's a shock. And maybe they get a broken bone, you know, or they get a concussion. So I, I personally have never worked with someone that just comes in with one thing. Right. It tends to be a combination. And then you add on the chronic stress of living in domesticated society yeah. with conditions and culture and rules that do not allow our, our biological needs to be met. I, th I think it'd be straightforward to say that even if you were lucky enough not to have experienced early or shock trauma, no one gets out no. of um, tr uh, you know chronic stress. No, uh, and I would even say, um, I'm sure there's some people. It's happening more now with more natural childbirthing practices happening, which is good to see. Yeah, 
But um, it's something called the medicalization of birth that really sort of started in the 40s and 50s, maybe a bit before, but that's when surgery became a big thing with delivering babies and not allowing, you know, it became very white collar medicine, you yeah. know, um, and mothers were not allowed to hold their babies after they were born. They were whisked away. Yeah. To, right. It's like how weird. Imagine a mother bear giving birth to her cub and you take that cub away. Yeah. She would not have that. She'd go crazy. Yeah, yeah. And that little baby cub would be so scared. And so we do that with so many. I'm sure that happened to me. Like, like what's with that? Yeah. So even though mother might mean well and you come home and everything is good, that initial beginning, if it doesn't get that nice connection, like you've just been inside mom for nine months and now you're on a metal tray yeah, with things going up your nose and you're being squeezed and poked and weighed and bundled up in this foreign piece of cloth that probably stinks of chemicals. It's in bright lights. Yeah, yeah. That's a trauma. And it's early and we can't understand it. And so, I, I, like I said, I haven't met anybody that doesn't have some form of that. Mm. And of course, if you go into a, a healthy home life and most things are okay, then you'll probably be fine. But then you add on top of that, the broken bone, the school that made you sit still for six hours a day, which was so many of us, no creativity, no play, um, I'm lucky that I was raised, you know, without cell phones in the 70s and 80s. We had recess. We had physical education. It was different than it is now. So what we're seeing is just this sort of mm, compounding. It's like compounding interest. Like it just keeps building and building because a lot of people are like, there were no problems with allergies and yeah. and chronic stress and autoimmune diseases in teenagers. And it's true. And of course, there's toxins in our food and water, and that's a whole other story that's yeah. depressing. <laughs> I understand that's because someone are like, but Irene, there's also toxins. I get the toxins. Yeah. Right. Trust me. But um, that that added stress that the younger generation are having, they it's like they can't keep it in. They can't they can't keep the freeze at bay. Yeah. Whereas our parent, my parents at least, like you might get your chronic illness or cancer in your 70s. Yeah, yeah. Not your 30s. Yeah. Right. So there's like this uptick of things speeding up. And I think it's just all those things. Um, and then to finish off another, not finish, but the other one that we didn't mention that is kind of within the early trauma and de it's developmental trauma is in utero trauma. Right. So mom, and again, mom doesn't have to be beaten or being in a terrible war zone, you know, which a lot of the studies have been with mothers that were post 9-11 or um, during uh, World War II. And of course, we'll have a whole slew of other situations like that. But um, even if she's just working full time hmm. and she can't rest when her body says rest, she's not getting the nutrition because she's having to eat, you know, at fast food places. There's, and she's working up until the day she gives birth. And then she goes back to work, at least in America, very quickly. And then her little baby is with a stranger, right? So again, no harm is being done, but there's this, this something is just not quite right. Yeah. And a lot of people will say, I just, something just doesn't feel right. Like yeah. I don't feel at ease. And it, and it could be something as simple as that. Because I get a lot of people that will say, oh, I've had no trauma. I'm like, yeah. I agree. You don't, you haven't had the kind of trauma that you think trauma is. But if it was that, that's enough to just slightly throw your system off. And then by the time you get to be 30 or 40 and you have a life event that's cr back to the chronic stress, mm -hmm. you see this when people go to grad school. Right. Or if people get into a really bad relationship or a bad job or they move and they don't have their support network that's sometime, or they get into a car accident, that's where you'll see the dysregulation from early pop. Right. And then they go, I don't understand. I was fine. And then I had this thing happen and now I can't get out of bed. That makes no sense. But if you look at the history of how long they've been holding in that, that thing that might've occurred in utero or early life, it makes 
perfect sense. A bit like the, I, I bent over to pick up a pen, my back went out. <laughs> it's like, yes, it, it wasn't the picking up the pen. It wasn't the pen. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's that classic saying, it's the straw that broke the camel's back. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So to, 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 to give that context, I thought um, <laughs> I would put myself <laughs> on the line, so sure. to speak. As I alluded to at the beginning, or as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the one of the absolute joys for me in doing the course or, or doing your work, your courses, was um, yes, having the somatic practices to, to work through every day, but having the theory to, to learn, and that giving me a framework to understand my life and, and my live life up to this point. I'm like, oh, now I can understand why, you know, I did this or why my behaviors were like that or you know, so on and so forth. And when I was working through this, what I was able to realize was that um, I, I basically have lived most of my life in a, like in a high alert flight state. Like I'm, I'm always rushing. I'm always ready to run. I mm -hmm. walk into a building and I can tell you exactly where the exit is. Uh, you know, yeah. my, my, a poor previous girlfriend lived with me for a period of time where my bags were packed. Like I, I was like, no, that's just storage. We don't have a drawer. It's the storage. It's like, <laughs> no, my bag was packed. I was able to Leave. get out of the situation yeah. very, very quickly. I didn't, I didn't recognize it like that, but that's now what I can see, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I would also have to exhaust because I had such an excess of that energy. I'd have to exhaust myself into a state of shutdown yep. to be able to do, to be able to do things, to, yep. to be able to make decisions. Like I couldn't work it out. So I would have to, you know, spend all this time trying to figure it out. And then I would just have to shut down in order to just to make a decision yes. that I didn't really care about because I just couldn't cope with being able to think about it anymore. Yep. 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 So and, and, you know, and I, I talked about at the beginning also having done a, uh, like a library's worth of different modalities in my life. What's been the joy for me in doing this work is mm -hmm. none of those, in my experience, none of those modalities gave me a framework. Mm -hmm. It was turn up for the weekend, get on the floor, you're doing this, you're doing that. Yeah. I, I, it wasn't explained to me. So therefore, I, yes, I could have the experience and maybe I could feel better in that moment. But when I went away, it didn't, you know, it didn't illuminate my previous experiences or, or give me a, a framework where I could then be in this state of flight, but understand why I'm there and then be able to recognize it. Um, it, it allowed me to have a lot more grace for myself because I could realize that, wow, like the reason I, you know, uh, was always ready to, to get out of that situation was because this is how I felt. Like I, I wasn't intentionally being an arsehole. I just, that's my, that was my state. So, and then in turn, I was able to say, okay, well, that person I had that interaction with that was, you know, chaotic for both of us, that, you know, it's unfair to say that was a true representation then because in the same way that I was being influenced by my state, they were being influenced by their state. It, 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 it was almost relieving and quite emotional to, to kind of recognize that. Yeah. <laughs> a bit like... <laughs> taken me so long to to figure that out and i've gone through all these different modalities and mm -hmm. traveled the world and mm -hmm. spoke to all these different people and, and all i had to do was just kind of come back and 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 kind of understand this theory and and, yeah. and begin with these practices i um yeah it, it, it was remarkable for me I, I i looked down my notes and i just saw this quote from peter levine that we we talked about earlier on um who you've mentioned throughout and his quote that's in your work says trauma is fundamentally a disruption in our ability to be in the here and now mm -hmm. And again, what you were saying, like some people say, well, they didn't have anything, you know. Yeah. If, if I think back in my life, I'm like, well, actually I had a pretty sweet life. Like I had no major issues. Like I didn't have accidents or I wasn't abused. I wasn't, you know. Yeah. But then, you know, you can kind of get into the subtleties of it and start to realize, oh, what I would identify as that yeah. is different than, than what my experience was. And, you know, I, just even as a very personal example, I remember my my um i have an older brother mm -hmm. and my my father was in the army and uh, mm. when he was born my my parents were posted to germany and my my father was always away on uh, you know different postings and my, my my mother telling me that she just had this baby she was 21 years of age she was in a foreign country oh. my brother would cry at night and she was told not to pick him of up of course and so this this poor child my brother would be screaming all night long and my mother would be so upset yeah. standing at the door yeah. wanting to pick pick yeah. my brother up but was was, was being guided by people that were telling her not in the end thankfully you know her mother said just pick the pick, child up of course bring it into your bed yes and you know <laughs> yeah she, she didn't know 
and, and, and I'm sure the people that advised her were well-meaning, but they, they didn't know. And it's, you know, these, these small everyday things that I, I don't even know if my brother knows that, mm. but I'm sure he wouldn't even conceive it. He's a military man himself now, ah. so he definitely wouldn't conceive it. So he, he learned his freeze. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, you can, there's a lot of similarity between yeah. my dad and my brother. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, not going too deep, you know, my, mm-hmm. my father was given away as a child. Like his, mm. his family situation didn't, his family situation worked out that him and his sister were given away when they were very young, yeah. two or three years of age. Yeah. My, my dad joined the army at 15. Oh, wow. You know, so it's like into adulthood, you know, he, he's very unable to, in fact, I had this experience with him where, you know, as I started to do this work and I, I said to him one day, oh, oh, I love you. And his response was instantly to shut down. Of course. And you could see he was so upset yeah. that he was shutting down. Yeah, but, but he, he couldn't help it. He couldn't express it. Yeah. And like, and, you know, and I understood that there was, there was no issue, but it, it was all, it was upsetting for me to see that even though he wanted to express it, he couldn't yeah. because that's the, the the state that he'd been in his entire life was 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 shut down. Well, it's interesting you say that because as you share a bit of your the family story, the vigilance that you make mention makes sense because you have a a, a father that has that military stoic. Oh, kind, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I can, I just know that. And so what happens when a little, even a little toddler is wanting that connection with dad and he won't give it, it's like, where is, where is everyone? Yeah. You know, and, and then I have to have energy to like make connection because you're not going to go into freeze because he is. And then you've got mom who, I mean, good thing she, her mother said, pick, pick your brother up. Yeah. But you know, I think that's always so fascinating to me because what it shows is, and this is no hit against any mother that listens to the pediatrician, it shows how much as humans we can override our instincts, mm. our maternal instincts. No bear is ever going, if a bear had their baby ta- a cub taken away and it's crying, it will kill to get into that, to get that, that cub. Yeah. And yet we can, as humans, stand there and watch a baby in distress and override our desire to go and go to it and help it. That shows us how strong our brain is and how strong our shutdown response is. And what I'll say, because there'll probably be some parents listening to this who feel horrible because they didn't listen to that, it's okay. That shows how strong our physiology is. That's why learning the education is so important because then you realize it wasn't because I was being a bad mother. I was being driven by bad information and my survival physiology was able to override the motherly instinct. It's really quite exquisite yeah. that that can happen. And then the hypervigilance piece is just, I'm looking to stay safe. Yeah. That's all, that's, I mean, it's as simple as it is, you're looking to be safe. Yeah, and I, you know, I think of that often, the, the, obviously the, the need to be safe and how that expresses itself for me, for others that I'm with. And, 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 and again, part of me like finds it um, heartbreaking, I suppose, because you become aware of like what someone's real needs are like to, to, to feel safe, you know, James and I, and, you know, we talk, we talk about this a lot, you, you know, our, our need to be safe and, and how that will inspire your actions or influence your actions, I should say. And, um, but then how that gets interpreted. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing I wanted to mention, it, I thought of it when you were talking about those, the story and the relationships of realizing that that person is in their own stuff and you're in your own stuff. This is why we have so many generations that keep repeating bad patterns is if you're not aware that that person isn't really trying to be difficult, they're just expressing their survival physiology in the way they know how. Mm. Um, you just kind of, it's like you're rolling down a hill into an abyss because you're not stopping that cycle of stored trauma. Yeah. And when I've worked with people, whether in practice or my students in my courses, you hear really hard stories of couples relationships family systems that will never heal because only one person in that family wants to actively do the work and what occurs is the family has to break and then that one person often it's the black sheep of the family (laughs) (laughs) they're like something's not right here and then they they fall into the education that you're talking about 
but you cannot force a person to learn this stuff. It's almost like it's cliche, but it's their journey. It's your journey. And this is where um, the whole community thing is really interesting with humans because the communities are often quite toxic that I see, whether mm. it's an intentional community, we would call that in North America. They're from what I've seen, they're terrible, <laughs> whether it's a healing community, um, whatever kind of community, you know, a religious congregation, whatever, if all this survival stress that's not dealt with is being bounced around, it doesn't matter what you're trying to heal in that methodology or, or religion or mind body or shamanic work. If you're not getting into how these patterns were formed, you're just going to be spinning. Yeah. And, and so this, this is totally my, this is my observations, my experiences that um, even take an easy one like breath work. Like you turn up and you do breath work and it's like you turn up for your half hour class, but you don't really know why you're doing the breath work. And, and so what, what I have observed and experienced is time and time again, going to various different classes and they're all missing the foundation, which is this. And, and so everyone's having to start on, you know, the, the, the second or the third rung of the ladder without realizing that, yeah. that they're missing this. And that, you know, when you go onto the second or the third rung, you're falling straight back off. You might feel good for an evening. You might feel good for a week. You, you're going to fall back off because you can't see the patterns, and you and you don't know how to how to cope with it. You know, if the only way you can cope with it is to book another class, then the class isn't really doing its thing. You know, or it's making you dependent. Yeah, and this is this is um, this is where it can sometimes sound like I'm being self righteous about the work that my colleagues and I do, um, and where I've taken it a little farther blending in the movement methodology of the Feldenkrais method along with Peter's work along with the early trauma work is you again these are tools breath work uh, cold therapy all the things you know exercise whatever it might be but if you don't have that self-regulation mm. I go back to the baby if you if you haven't built that self-regulation you're just piling management strategies, coping strategies onto a dysregulated system. It's the classic example is you can't build a house without a solid foundation. Yeah. It might hang around for a while, but the moment there's wind, an earthquake, flood, it's just going to crumble to the floor, to the ground. And again, back to the baby, you, you cannot create a healthy human without that base level co-self-regulation. Now, someone might say, well, I'm here, I'm functional, I didn't have that. And that's, as I said earlier, we can go really far and do a lot with dysregulation. But from a macro level on planet Earth now, we're at this point where things are gonna tip one direction or another. And we're, it's like everyone doing these methodologies, I know they're doing them for, for the reason and the intention of healing. But it's like slightly veering off to the wrong path. Yeah. And you are a living example of this, as are the thousands of people that have gone through my courses that are like, I have spent my entire life trying to figure this out. And to be honest, a lot of people I don't think go into the work because they've exhausted their resources. Yeah. And they don't trust anymore. Well, so that makes me think of, you know, again, using myself as a personal example, I have been taught by many dysregulated teachers. Of course. And, you know, it, it really bugs me, <laughs> yeah. really, really bugs yeah. me that, uh, not that, I, I, don't, I don't know how, you, how people would become certified, but you can, anyone can hold a workshop and, you know, you walk through the door. And so again, this is my experience. I've walked through many doors. Mm -hmm. I have not asked the teacher, so, you know, what's the school with you? Yeah. I would like to know about you before I expose myself mm -hmm. to whatever teaching you're, mm -hmm. you, that you're going to have. Mm -hmm. and, Fuck! I've been in some really scary situations mm -hmm. because I because I haven't done that. I didn't even think to do it. Yeah. No. Like, no. Why, most, why, why, why would you? Yeah. Like my, I give them, <laughs> I give them my trust yes. to someone. Yeah. I, I actually find it relatively hard to to trust someone now. No, no, that's wrong. I shouldn't say that. I'm very wary. Yeah, you're of, skeptical. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. My yeah. my starting point healthy is to be, skeptic. Yeah. Exactly. To, to to ask some serious questions. Well, he, well, here's the thing with this is my. Um, philosophy on why this is happening. I'll give an example. So 
Not that medicine is perfect because it's not. Yeah. But there's some good things with medicine. You know, you can fix a broken leg. You can save a baby, burn victims. Yeah. Uh, you know, like there's some good stuff, right? Yeah. And to be a doctor, you have to go through certain hoops, mm -hmm. obviously. Pre-med, med, you got to pass exams. You need to do residency. You need to basically kill yourself. And I don't agree with that. However, you have to harden yourself and prove that you can do that thing. There's no equivalent. Yes. In this other world we're talking about. It's a free for all. <laughs> it's a free for all. And so what happens, you know, so then if we go back to medicine, um, when you learn, and I'm not saying that people don't make money from medical school, but there is some level of standardization mm -hmm. where schools, you know, sure you have to pay and yes, students get into debt. I get that. But it's not an entrepreneurial enterprise. Yeah. I don't know if you see where I'm yes. going here. Oh, yes. hundred so, percent. So what happens, and I know this because I still have to, you know, live my life and I have a mortgage and things and needs and all that. I need to make money. Um, my colleagues and teachers have to make money. But up until now, nobody has created whatever school it might be called where there is subsidy, there's donorship, there's an ability for a student to get a loan because what's happening is the people that are able to afford to become the breathwork teacher, they have somehow managed to figure out how to do that. Whereas, you're, so you're kind of getting a selection of a certain type of person doing these yeah. courses. And I've seen trainings where people get graduated, Chris, and they shouldn't be, but it's because the teacher needs the money to yeah. keep the business open. Medical school is not really considered a business. It's a school and a university. And so I hope for those listening, they listen and they see why this is sideways. Yeah. And we, ha we have to find a way to get the, the teaching of this work, not just in me, like with what I do with my future students, but like it has to spread out. But it also means that people have to accept that there is a right way to start people off on this somatic trauma healing journey. And so far, because I know a lot of the, the people that have led the way, nobody wants to play. Nobody sure. wants to collaborate, like real collaboration the way medical schools used to collaborate, mm. where you would edit a textbook. Like a, a medical textbook isn't one person writing it. Yeah. If you've ever looked at one, it's 50 editors writing different chapters. There's no equivalent of that book in my field. Um, and so that's where we're, we're missing. Everybody's kind of in their silo. There's a lot of ego. Yeah. And it's entrepreneurial. And I get it because I'm an entrepreneur too. People need to yeah. make money. It, 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 you know, what comes to mind is the danger of charismatic leaders. Yes. <laughs> that yes. Will, that will, the guru. You know, yeah, the guru. There you go. That's the perfect, <laughs> the perfect name for it. And uh, <laughs> yeah, the guru. And, you know, how frankly how fucking dangerous that is, it is. and I, again I've, I've put myself in that situation not as the guru i'll just point out but no. as the person you know following these people yeah i guess the obvious examples are you know and, and they're just low fruit to bikram yeah bikram or osho or john friend yeah exactly. yep. you know yep. these charismatic cult leaders yep. you know jim jones and yes uh, the, these people that are able to get people to do things because they're dysregulated and they're just you know so on and so forth yeah well, and it's also happening, I don't know this personally firsthand, but I've heard there are communities that are focused on plant medicine where the disciples are basically doing everything. Oh, yeah, I've and, seen that. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, that's a freaking cult. That's not a healing situation. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of, we're in a real, we're, one of my friends would say, our colleagues, we're in the Wild West hundred percent. Just like medicine was the wild west a while ago. Yeah. And by while, I mean thousands of years ago. And so the, the solution I don't think is going to just happen in the next 10 years, but there needs to be a demand from the public that this improve yeah. because right now it's just experimental, mm -hmm. right? It's all experimental. You can't study the work I do in the way that you would study, say, surgery. Yeah. It's not that simple. And so that's the other thing is there's a lot of people that want evidence-based 
somatic therapy. I'm like, yeah, it's not going to happen. You could try to study this with brain EEGs and, and seeing changes in blood, but the system is too clever. You know, go back to quantum physics. The moment you observe, everything changes. Yeah. And so, you know, there also has to be a different way in which we validate and qualify what should be given to someone, what shouldn't, and how you treat someone. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So then, um, we talked about dysregulation, you know, we talked about the different states and about dysregulation, and you mentioned about co-regulation. I'm sure someone's asking, <laughs> how do I regulate? Right, <laughs> right, right, right. So, right. you know, to, just to kind of ask the obvious question, you know, what, how to regulate the nervous system, you know, what does that look like? We, yeah. we talked about the ideal state being, um, uh, a, we talked about the ideal state including low tone dorsal, mm -hmm. a tiny amount of sympathetic mm -hmm. nervous system and the ventral vagus. How, how do we get to the ideal state? Yeah, so we don't do it by thinking about those nerves. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, I, so this is the interesting thing that the education is important. And if anything, it's the first step. Because when you start to do the practices that I'll talk about in a second, if the system doesn't respond in the way you've projected it might, mm -hmm. you're going to think you're doing it wrong, you're crazy, or the teacher's terrible, right? I've had students who are like, you don't know what you're doing because this happened when I did this. Like, okay, fair enough. And I've done enough of this to know that actually this is the step to take but you have to understand that there's not a linear path when you try this practice. And one day it might provide this result and the next day that result and the next day that result. Yeah. And if you don't have the education, you won't understand why it's all over the place. So the education is important because as humans, our brains need to make meaning out of what's happening. So that's the first kind of step towards regulation is actually, I, I've been saying recently, become a, you have to become a scholar right. of your physiology. Right. The second thing, and this, this is not an order of importance, would be learning how to follow your biological impulses. So back to the baby, when it's hot, mama hopefully takes off clothing. Cold, bundles it up. Hungry, eat. Not hungry, you can't, you can't force feed a baby by the way, like, whereas humans can, we can yeah. eat when we're not hungry. Yeah. Right. Um, gas. How many people do you know that say, excuse me, pardon me. I'm sorry. It's very bad in Britain. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. It's, it's like, who, what are you sorry for? You didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> it's like you're trying to get through in a line and someone says, sorry. It's like, interesting. You know? <laughs> I think that's a colonization thing, but that's another. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this mass apology right, right, for, right. you know. Um, so if you think about animals again in the wild, when that cow is having a poop on the pasture, he or she isn't thinking, is anybody going to hear this? <laughs> they just let it out. Yeah. And what's interesting, if you've never, I, I was raised around dairy farms, so I know animals. My parents are both veterinarians. But if you've never been out in pastures and in the wild and you've, you know, it's shocking if you see a cow just poop. Yeah. It's like, what? And pee. It's like, that's insane. Yeah. Right. But that's how babies are. Yeah. And so one of the things, as odd as it is, that we teach our students is listening to when you need to use the toilet. Are you holding in your bladder for five hours? Are you not having water when you're thirsty? Are you overeating? Are you not feeding yourself? Are you tired, but you're forcing to stay awake? Like all these things, um, that starts to slowly shift the system into better autonomic nervous system health. Um, and even just working on that, as simple as it is, for some people is revolutionary. Now for some that might not work because they don't even know how to sense. Mm. So then you go the next step, which is, okay, does that person need to go in or do they need to go out? Like your, your viewers can't see this, but I'm looking at this beautiful, you know, trees and leaves and wind. Many people, to go back to Peter's quote, have never considered there's a world out there. Yeah. Because they're so 
internal because the world was really dangerous growing up, whether that world was their parents, their school system, actual war, the accident that has them still in shock, you know, Ted Kaczynski, like, yeah, God, the world was dangerous because it, they, you know, messed with him. Yeah. So orienting to the environment is important. Um, but for some, this is how it gets tricky. That actually might be terrifying. And someone might be like, what? It's a beautiful vista. The clouds are moving. It's like, no, that's too much. Yeah. Um, so then for some, it might be, can you feel your feet on the floor? Can you feel, feel the chair? Can you feel the microphone? Um, and then for some, that's wonderful. Like, whoa, there's a chair. I've never considered that. That shows us how disconnected somebody might be from their body, even though they've been living in the world forever. But some people, that might be too much. Yeah. And then this is where we kind of, it's like we go, go to the bottom levels of how early was this dysregulation? And for some people, the dysregulation was so young in utero or past generations that you have to then work with what I call the stress organs. So the kidneys, the adrenals, the gut, the brainstem. Um, I won't go through all the lists because there's long, this is what's in Smart Body, Smart Mind, but the different levels of the physiology that contract or completely let down and stop work working when there is a threat. And this is where the work gets almost boring mm -hmm. because there's nothing fancy happening when you're working at that stress level physiology. You're just helping the system um, realize it's okay to maybe feel safety. This is how you know someone isn't trauma informed in a workshop. They just say, think of your safe space. <laughs> it's like, what if someone never experienced safety? They don't, they don't know what that means. It's yeah. like you just gave them a map in Russian and they don't speak Russian. Yeah. It's like, I can't read this. Yeah. So education, being able to follow impulse, biological impulse, being in touch with the environment, being in touch with the body, and then working at the stress organ level, and then kind of the, the next level, and again, the order is not important, is working with the movement patterns. Mm -hmm. That's where the Feldenkrais work comes in. That's a bit more advanced. Right. I wouldn't want to work with someone at that level if they can't feel their body in the chair. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't want to work with someone at that level if they can't look around and, and have that relax them. Um, and interestingly enough, there was someone who wanted to come to this workshop and they were not happy with our FAQ section on the website that said to join, it is strongly required that you can regulate and contain and feel emotions as they come up on your own without support. Hmm. They thought that was unethical and not good. It's like, okay but we're doing higher level work and it says so. This is Feldenkraisian in nature. We're not doing gentle somatic yeah. connection. But um, the reason why they thought that was unethical is they knew someone who did a retreat in another country, which will remain nameless, where the leaders blew her up yeah. and nobody was there to pick up the pieces and she was terrified. Mm -hmm. So of course that makes sense, but I'm asking, you gotta come in with some base level regulation, but th that showed me most people don't know what that means. Yeah. So to work with teaching an adult human how to self-regulate is very intricate, the same way it's intricate to raise a human from age day one to age five or age 18 you need all these pieces in place. It can't just be one thing. Um, and then the techniques, the management strategies might come in. You might ask someone, yeah, maybe some, some cold is good. Maybe a little learning how to breathe and feel how your lungs can expand is good, but don't do it without the context of how to listen to your body inside. Yeah. And this is where a lot of these practices are being seen as, oh, that's nervous system regulation. We're doing vagal toning. No, it's not. Yeah. Regulation work is quite slow. It's very, very um, specific and detailed, but it's also very macro, mm. right? Because eventually a regulated system doesn't need to do breath work, doesn't need to cold plunge. It doesn't need to meditate. 
Yeah. It's just able to live the way we're sitting here right now. And then the next level, if I go further, would be meditation. Yeah. But you don't want to meditate and do those higher level um, consciousness practices until you can stay tethered in the worst circumstance. Yeah, it makes me think that um, if you were going to stand on top of a mountain, you'd have had to have acquired the skills. Y yes. You know, all things aside about getting dropped off by a helicopter, you would have had to acquire the skills. You would die if you didn't. Right, to, to get yes. to the top. So so therefore the barriers to entry are actually, okay, well, you, you've got to spend the years doing the foundational work. You know, one of my, uh, you know, pretty vocal, one of my big problems about the wellness industry is that there are no barriers to entry and that you can turn up and as long as you can pay the fee, yes, you sir. can get absolutely blasted. Yeah. And again, that's, that's what yeah. I did. Yeah. And, um, you know, it can be dangerous. Like, like I have had some really scary, dangerous mm -hmm. situations. Put myself into some epically dangerous situations. Oh yeah, people die at these retreats. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. I heard of one just recently. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then, and then also, even if, you know, you can come back seriously messed up. Yep. And I know a number of practitioners who basically their business is dealing with people that come back psychosis that are, that are more fucked up than when they yep. went. Yep. Yep. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, so it's like uh, just be able to have those. And again, I, I think this comes to, well, I suppose this, this comes down to the leader, doesn't it? Like sort of setting out the, the boundaries, setting out the terms mm -hmm. so that when you turn up, turn up like you, you already have trust in the teacher because they've already told you what it's going to be about mm -hmm. as opposed to you just, I can pay my 50 pounds and book my, yeah. you know, my, my sound bath, yeah. you know, um, tonight yeah. and, and, and do this. And then there's, you know, who knows what, what goes yeah. on. Yeah. No, your, your mountaineering example is really good. Cause I live that world of being in the outdoors, doing that stuff. And yeah, uh, you can't just be on the top of a hill with a pair of skis yeah. and know what to do. You will die. Yeah. And, um, I think it, it seems extreme, but it isn't because if you get the, the term we use is blown up, you know, like you survive and now you're either in a psychosis or, um, you can't sleep. We've had people call us or not call, email us who have not been able to sleep for a year after a breath work, after mm. a Vipassana, after an ayahuasca. And then because of the survival stress that that person is in and they're not going into the low tone dorsal of rest, digest, they could get Crohn's yeah. and they could lose their gut, you know, or they can get an autoimmune condition or they can get cancer because, or they make a stupid decision because they are not centered and they're not healthy. Um, and again, it's not to say, cause some people are like, oh, you're blaming the plant medicine. It's like, I'm not blaming the plant. Yeah. I'm, I'm, if I were to put a blame, it's on the people who are being negligent. Yeah. But the thing is, Chris, they actually don't realize they're being negligent because they're yeah. probably in their own form of functional freeze and spiritual bypass. Yeah. And this is where, um, I can't, I can't make a bet that if I was a betting gal, I would say 99.7 percent. <laughs> I'll give, I'll give two, two points there. Um, uh, of the people leading a lot of these um, retreats and even a lot of somatic trainings, um, are not regulated. Yeah, it, and it's unfortunate. But I, I've seen it in my own community. I've seen it in other communities. It's, it's really quite fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I would agree. You know, you yeah, know. from my experience, yeah, I would, I you're would living agree. proof. Yeah, and I'm glad you're okay because some people never find that information and never get out of it. Yeah, and, and I will say, yeah, I am, I am okay. But through the period of doing that, it, it, it influenced a lot of my behavior. Mm -hmm. And that behavior had consequences. Of course. And, and I'm still dealing with some of that, yeah. some of the consequences. Yeah. And, you know, some of it's really quite upsetting, mm -hmm. not, not just for me, but for the people that I interacted with. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, so like, I, like I physically, I, I, I got away, you know, so to sure. speak, but, um, but, but certainly emotionally, like yep. it, it created a lot of mentally and emotionally created a lot of havoc for, for myself and for others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and, it's a hard one because everyone has to do their own journey, right? Which sounds really yep. cliched. It's true. Uh, but you know, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. <laughs> no, no. And I think that's the other thing is it is tough because globally you see 
so many bad things happening and there's this desire for collective healing, but no matter how many ways you look at it, the only way collective healing happens or collective awareness is at each individual level. Yeah. You can't force a person or, a gr or sorry, I'll repeat. You can't force a group to change collectively. Yeah. It's impossible for humans. Yeah. Um, and that's where it seems like a massive task, but it's like, and, and no, to quote, to quote Peter again, um, he said once in a workshop, the only way the human species will find enlightenment is when each single person on this planet has a regulated nervous system. I mean, is there a better quote? <laughs> that's a good one. Um, so just to, to kind of talk about regulation then, um, again, just to kind of use my own experience of, uh, so I've been doing your work for, for well, I did your course almost a year ago uh, to, you know, to the day and you know, before that I'd worked my way through the resource on the website. So I just thought maybe I could share what, what I've been yeah, experiencing. Definitely. So, and actually this is, this is good timing because of an email you sent out this week. <laughs> um, so actually I've started to become a lot more, well, to begin with, I started to experience a lot of surging energies and, you know, I, I kind of dislike the term anxiety because it, yeah. it's such a, a people strong, would, people will call it anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I started to experience a lot of tangibly experience anxiety i'd be waking up in the night with energy coursing through my body mm -hmm. I, I would find it really overwhelming and again you know i was working my way through through the theory and through the practices um the somatic practices which to begin with were the becoming aware of one's uh, own bodily impulses um and, and so on and so forth so that that was interesting to me but because i had the theory i you know was wake up in the night with this anxiety i was like oh that's okay it's really uncomfortable, but because I've got this theory background now, I understand what's happening. So therefore, like I can ride out this storm, even though it's uncomfortable, because I know, you know, why this is happening. I started also to become a lot more aware of how dysregulated I was on a regular basis. Yes. Like it was astonishing to me. Yes. I was like, all of a sudden, I was like, freaking hell! Like, yeah. have I always been like this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it genuinely such a big surprise to me. Yeah. I, I remember. A, uh, you know, a friend said to me, like, Chris, you're, you know, you're kind of like a highly anxious person. I was like, what, what are you talking about? Like, a, no, I'm, no, I'm not, you know, like I would have defended my position on that. And, and anxiety means different things to different people. Mm. But, um, but certainly I, I, I was experiencing that. And so you sent an email out this week that, that kind of addressed that exact point. Yes. Um, maybe you want to talk, talk to that. Gosh, I don't remember what um, it was. <laughs> you tell me. So basically you said that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't indication that things were getting worse. This was an indication right, that your healing, are you going backwards? Yeah, Thank your, you. your capacity was yeah. increasing. Well, well, this is where I think people get screwed up is they don't realize how much freeze or how much low level vigilance they have. And then when they really start to tune into the body and lift that freeze or that intense vigilance, they feel the real survival stress that's been there since birth or before birth. Right. And it, and it, it, and it can be scary and it can be intense because it can throw your life off. I'll, I'll be really honest. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, it can feel like death and I've experienced what we would call anxiety, but it's deep survival stress coming to the surface in ways that most people would go to the hospital and get medicated. So, I mean, not quite like that, but when I started to do this work, so I had December last year, December, 2022 is when I worked my way through the course. And I was experiencing a lot, a lot of this over the Christmas period. And I had a job that start, was starting on the, the second, uh, like a photography film job. And, and I remember thinking like, holy shit, I don't, like if I'm experiencing this all day, every day, this is gonna be so intense. What happened for me was that I, I guess subconsciously, I shut it down. Yeah. Like I was just, yeah. I, I didn't even, it I wasn't my intention to, but as soon as that job shut, it basically overrode everything that I was experiencing yeah. and feeling and shut it down. And, and, and I, I understood what was happening. Part of me was relieved because mm -hmm. I wasn't sure how we'd get through that month mm -hmm. having that. And part of me was disappointed. Yeah. So I was like, I've only just started yeah. to feel this and now yeah. shut it down. And this is, this is where culture and human needs of making money and, and sh like, and, and I, I say to people, if you have children, you know, as one example, you need to work, uh, sometimes you might need to override to get the job done, to right. feed your kids. Cause right. you don't want to just be in a corner shaking and have your kids go starving, you know? So it's kind of this, it's tough because you, you really need to kind of in one way pick your battle. Yeah. 
And, but also know now, like you said, you have the awareness. So you're aware you're going into a coping strategy and then you know how to pull yourself out as you get better at it. I mean, I don't love flying the way I used to because I feel way too much now. Yeah, right. And, you know, am I going into a little bit of freeze? Maybe, I don't know. But, you know, if anything, I'm kind of riding that low level of just a little bit of survival stress and being okay with it so that I don't go into freeze when I get on a plane now. Whereas before, I had no troubles on a plane. 16 hours, not a problem. And, 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 and to go back to what we were talking about earlier on with like the, the various modalities, understanding that, as in understanding what my state is, okay, I, I need to do, actually employ some like down-regulating yes, work. Yes, 100%. Because you understand what you're having rather than, or what's it, what you're experiencing rather than just kind of starting to use some tools. Yeah, yeah, no, and this is the thing. That's why I say some of the strategies that are taught that will be considered biohacks can be wonderful, right? If someone feels like they are about to hit their kid and they have to take some deep breaths, yeah, take some deep breaths, yeah, yeah, right? Realize that your, your anger responses are coming up and that should not go out to that, that person, that thing, that animal, and then do some resourcing things. But if that anger comes up and you're in the comfort of your own home and you're connecting to it, then let it come out. Yeah. Right. And and this is where there's context is so, so important. Cause I also see parents go over the top with being too emotional with their kids. And then the kids start to take care of the parent. Right. Because they're processing their trauma. It's like that kid does not did not sign up to help you process your trauma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know? So that that's the other thing is you have to still you have to have some common sense. Yeah. And give the situation the benefit of the doubt and, and go, okay, we don't have to do this today. Yeah, yeah. I'll share one other example of the, uh, of, uh, of the regulation for me, which I love this because it, it, it's just such a, a strange synchronicity. I was always a very good runner when I was a child, but I hated it. I hated to physically run. Uh, you know, I, I play football or soccer, but like I, I hated to go out and go for a run, even though I was, I was very quick and I had great endurance. And that persisted my entire life. And then over the past few years, I've experienced uh, you know, like a knee injury and I, I wasn't able to run. Like, so it wasn't even like, a, <laughs> I didn't yeah. want to express it. I just wasn't able to. Since beginning this work last year, I have utterly fallen in love with running again. Mm. And I can actually run again. Like the issues that were causing the knee, the knee pain, I've been able to understand that, release that tension. And now it's like, I, I, like it's I a would, joy. Yeah, yeah. Now I can't wait to run. Like, yeah. It's like, this is really funny. Like when I was emotionally running and mentally running the entire time, like I just physically couldn't run. And now that I'm not running as much <laughs> in, in the emotional mm -hmm. and mental states, physically, all I want to do is run. Yeah. It, it was, it, it was still a really heartwarming moment for me to, to realize yeah. that and to understand that, Oh, here was my body expressing. It's like, well, you know, if you're going to run from this and you're not running, you know, you, you can't run like that. And yeah. now that you're not running from this, now you can run like that. Yeah. And, and you can enjoy it and it's a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah was, that's it, so good. It, it was amazing for me. I was just like, oh, mm. you know. And now you're going to allow, now you're active. And that's the other, that's one very important piece is that exercise we need to do. But so many of us have conditions around exercise or we've been conditioned in a way that isn't healthy around it. Yeah. And so we either do too much of it or we don't do it at all. Yeah. And what I again have found with students, just like you said, so it's so nice to keep hearing this, is they're now moving their body in a way that is um, harmonious. Mm. They're not doing it to sacrifice themselves, to numb out something yeah. or to prove something. Yeah. You know, they'll listen and like, no, I think I'm going to rest today or no, today's the day. And so they're following that impulse. Yeah. Um, but for most, a lot of sport and that is just completely unconscious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, th I think we've probably covered everything. We covered a lot. Yeah. Everything now, not everything, but a lot. Irene, thank you so much. You're welcome. Like, honestly, I can't express how nice it is to, yeah, to have had been, a conversation. It's been with fun. To, to I don't think you. I've ever done a podcast in person, by the way. Oh, really? Wow. This, and we're in this like cool space to see. Yeah, yeah no. Well, we, uh, you know, uh, we used to do all of our podcast. I mean, we started the podcast in 2018, so we did them all in person until right. obviously COVID. And then actually... I think both James and I both kind of started to lose a love for it because for mm. me, it was about meeting someone. Exactly. <laughs> it was about being in their presence and, yeah. you know, and, and reading, yeah. 
you know the way that they interact and and having these natural you know kind of interruptions so um so your website is irene lyons just my name you got it and i guess your is your instagram the same Irene yeah, Lyons. it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I would highly recommend that. If you and want. you too. Yeah, it's all Irene Lyons. I think the only one that has an underscore is Twitter, but I don't do much over there. So. Right. Okay. And, yeah. and so there's so many, a tremendous amount yes. of resources that are available for free. You're, you're very active on your YouTube. So there's mm-hmm. lots of videos, um, conversations with people that have done your work. Yeah, and lots just, of them. And, and, and just you talking to camera about, uh, about this work. And then there's several um, free resources on your website. So there's a way for people to get involved Mm-hmm. If they you know don't have the resources to to go up to the next oh, level, yeah. but but even that you know the 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 twenty one day nervous system is, is that's the ex- best is very cheap and that's the best very way to, yeah that's the best way to start I mean do some of the free stuff but it it is important to have some practices that are a bit more expansive yeah um, and if a person can invest in that and I mean I love that you've been doing it for a year this is what a lot of people don't realize it's not just something that you do and then you're like oh it did nothing yeah I, all I'll say is trust me when i say it will do something pending how frozen a person is they might have to do it a lot more yeah to get out of that and and that's so normal and the commitment i think commitment too is a really important word here in terms yeah. of you don't just go to don't just do it for one weekend and Mm-mm. then and then you're sorted it's like no, no this is a you know, it's lifestyle how, yeah knowing how your body is is feeling and what it's trying to tell mm-hmm. you that's a lifetime's work it is. And well, I not li- even work. That, that's no, it's life. just life. It's life. And I liken it to um, exercise and diet, you know, which were my first areas of study. You don't just exercise for 21 days and then you stop. Yeah. Or you don't just eat well for 21, or at least I hope you don't, you know, yeah. and then you stop. <laughs> it is a constant commitment, repetitive. But the, the thing that is different with this work is when you do get that baseline re- regulation or close to it, you don't need to do the practices in the same way, yeah, because it, it's just wired into the into the system, yeah. So that's the difference between eating well. You can't just wire in eating well. You have to do it, yeah. Whereas this, once you put enough work and by enough, sometimes like I'll be honest, it's like minimum two years. Most people, it's five to six, seven years, yeah. And that might seem like what. But again, if you didn't get that baseline regulation, it's like you're going back to what didn't happen in those first five years of life. Yeah, right. Okay, right. Makes, I mean, makes perfect sense. Yep. And again, I would encourage people to, who aren't sure about that, it's like, it's it's life. Yeah. (laughs) Those those six years are happening anyway, hopefully. They (laughs) are. And and you will, the, the person who embarks on this, they'll know because, and again, I hear this over and over again, People will say, I don't know how I've lived this long without this work. Yeah. And that kind of says it all, Mm -hmm. but you have to dive into it long enough to understand what that means. Yeah. Yeah. A wonderful way to finish. Thank you so much, Arnie. You're welcome. Thank you.